So our next uh, speaker is Anne Wagner. Um, Anne's going to be speaking about uh, combining cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD with MDMA um, treatment. First cases and understanding the MDMA experience from a cognitive behavioral framework. Uh, Anne C. Wagner received her doctoral degree in clinical uh, psychology at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, and currently holds a Canadi Canadian Institutes of Health Research postdoctoral fellowship in Ryerson. She has been the recipient of multiple awards for her scholarly activity and community involvement. Anne's current work focuses on the treatment and prevention of post-traumatic stress disorder, with a particular interest in novel combination interventions, such as cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy plus MDMA. Anne has done significant work with communities affected by HIV and is particularly interested in the needs of women and interpersonal relationships. Please help me welcome Anne Wagner. Thank you, Anne. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks so much for sticking with us. I know we're getting near the end of the day. So I am going to be talking about combining cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD and MDMA. And specifically, this is a brand new study that we're doing. We're in the pilot phase. And so I'm really excited to be sharing some ideas with you about it and our first impressions. So our t team... Sorry, I think this is the other um, slide deck. But while we're maybe checking into that, I can tell, introduce our team to you. So our team is myself, Michael Methofer, Annie Methofer, and Candace Monson. And so we're a MAP-sponsored uh, MAP sponsored study. And we are also supported by Ryerson University in Toronto and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research for my support and funding. Maybe I'll start going, but while we're seeing if my seeing about the slides. So as we know, and as we've heard talked about in the past several presentations, early on, users of MDMA were talking a lot about acceptance of self and others, and particularly the tolerance of emotionally upsetting materials, and the ability to address these issues without extreme disorientation. Awesome. That's it. Thanks. And so really, when we think about these three things together, that's a perfect setup for A, doing PTSD treatment, and B, doing couples work. So therefore, it's really no surprise that before MDMA was scheduled in 1985, it was used for a variety of concerns, including relationship distress, PTSD, and anxiety. So as we've seen from Michael and Annie's talk earlier, the phase one and two studies of, st of looking at um, MDMA use for PTSD in individuals demonstrated large effect size improvements in PTSD symptoms. And using this, we've had seen MDMA combined with non-directive supportive psychotherapy. So our question is really, could we do this? Would we see similar effects or potentially more addi additive effects if we use another psychotherapy alongside of it? Because oftentimes when we talk about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, we talk about it as a whole, but really it's one way of doing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So that's what we're starting to look at here. So I want to introduce to you what is actually cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD. And for short, I'm calling it CBCT for PTSD. So CBCT for PTSD is a three-phase, 15-session protocol that we use with couples to treat PTSD. And our evidence so far for CBCT for PTSD comes from randomized control trials, and we have large effect sizes. So we see similar results for CBCT for PTSD as the other gold standard treatments that we currently have for PTSD out there. And of course, as we heard then talk about even the best treatments we have right now only treat about 50% of people, maybe up to 60% in our best controlled rigorous trials. That is a fraction of the folks who actually have PTSD, right? We need to think about what we can do to bridge that gap beyond there. So CBCT for PTSD, this is, these are the three phases that we have. Phase one talks about the introduction, psychoeducation, and safety building. And really, you're doing safety building with the couple. You're talking about aggression. You're talking about anger. You're talking about the things that PTSD will, can bring to a relationship. In phase two, you start talking about relationship enhancement and decreasing avoidance. 
And that's a massive part of this, relationship enhancement. So we're thinking about not just decreasing PTSD symptoms, but also improving the relationship and improving outcomes for the partner as well. So really you get three birds, one stone potentially from this treatment. And so within this phase two, we talk about reducing avoidance. Avoidance being this seminal piece of PTSD. And it has such great impact, not only on the individual, but also on the couple. So the idea of how is avoidance impacting their lives, their lives together, and their lives individually, as so we start to approach it there. And then in phase three, here it's described as dyadic cognitive intervention. What does that mean? What we're talking about is we're talking about the things that get stuck in the meaning that we make about the trauma. When we think about a cognitive behavioral approach to treating PTSD, that's what we're talking about. We're thinking about making sense of the things that you're keeping the person stuck within the PTSD. And here we're doing it together. We're doing it with the helpful gaze and eyes of the partner as well. So why would we put these two things together? We know that we have some treatments that work, but they don't work for everyone. Also, we want to think about closing the gap for people who are not getting better, improving outcomes more generally, and potentially in a broader way than just with PTSD symptoms. And we've seen some really compelling evidence that MDMA with, not, with supportive non-directive psychotherapy has wonderful effects. So imagine if we put them together and within a couple's format, what could potentially happen? So could we have an additive augmenting potentiating effect? It's the first time that we're putting a standalone evidence-based psychotherapy for PTSD together with MDMA. It's also the first time that we have an FDA-approved research study being conducted with couples where they're both being given a MDMA. And what I want to emphasize here actually is the fact that one person has MDMA, or has PTSD, I should say, and both people are being given MDMA. So that means we're actually dosing someone who does not have a diagnosis. So other studies that have studied PTSD and MDMA oftentimes use a transpersonal theoretical model. They'll use elements of internal family systems therapy, parts theory, other ideas within the model of treatment when we are doing the supportive psychotherapy. So we asked the question, why would CBT maybe work? Part of the question behind this is a very pragmatic one, right? So a lot of the treatment that's being disseminated for PTSD in lots of research settings and hospitals, it's cognitive behaviorally based. That's the ones that are out there already. So part of it is a bit um, strategic in the idea that if this is a treatment, for example, CBCT is already being disseminated in the VA, if we can demonstrate that, hey, the treatment that we're already disseminating, we know is already working, could be made potentially even better, adding MDMA to it, hmm, look at that. We've already got some clinicians trained up in CBCT. You could add this on to it. So there's some thoughts around that. Also, the idea that we know that CBT works for couples. So I think that this is one thing we can think about especially when we think about the communication and empathy components to MDMA. The thoughts and feelings, that's the focus of CBCT, and it's really, I mean, it's universal. It's what we hear talked about and what is working and what we're thinking about happening within MDMA psychotherapy for PTSD. The emotion is accessible. We're not avoiding. It's not getting in the way of the processing of the trauma. And as we've talked about in several conversations earlier today, the idea of an optimal zone of arousal. So we're keeping people in that zone to be able to think about those thoughts and those feelings and how that might impact. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the process of developing a pilot treatment study. So like Ben, actually, it's great to hear that. I also was part of the MT1 experience. So this was actually the very first step in developing this idea, getting dropped in, knowing very little about this, and then having the experience as a therapist myself going through the protocol. And so I went through the protocol with the idea in mind of like, hmm, okay, I should pay attention to what I can do when and you know what would be good to do in terms of combining these together. So that was originally my thought going in. And then as soon as my session started, I'm like, oh, forget this. I'm using it for my own therapy. This is fantastic. So I mean, that coming from that place actually gives me a lot of information about how effective that could possibly be. So that was the starting point. That was the information we started with, was our own personal experiences doing the MT1 so then we decided to develop it into uh, a pilot using 10 dyads. So it can be with romantic or non-romantic dyads. It just has to be with someone in your life for which you are going to be able to go through a therapy journey with. They're close to you. 
you have PTSD in one member of the dyad, and then both participants will receive 75 to 100 milligrams of MDMA. So the first session, they get two sessions of MDMA. Um, the first session at 75 with an optional, optional supplemental half dose. And the second session, they have the option of 75 or 100 milligrams plus the optional supplemental half dose. And then we're looking at primary and secondary outcomes. And so I'm going to take you through what the flow of that looks like. But we're doing assessments at baseline, mid, post, three-month follow-up, and six-month follow-up. So part of the interesting thing, too, for us is we're also doing a compressed delivery of CBCT. So normally, this is a weekly psychotherapy done in an office. It's so usually 75 minutes spread out over you know, three to four months. Let's take some time. So what we're doing here is not only are we doing it combining it with MDMA, but we're compressing it down into a shorter length of time. So the whole length of the protocol takes up to um, two months. So it's a much shorter time frame, potentially. And so we're also combining at the moment with in-person and video therapy visits to potentially widen the reach of how this could work. So some of our biggest challenges and thoughts that we're going through so far as we're developing this are what goes where? What, where do you do the protocol? Where do you combine it? Where can you combine it? Um, how do you optimize the combination of MDMA plus CBCT? And what do you do during the MDMA sessions? These are all questions that we've been asking ourselves. And it's been an iterative process of trying to develop this protocol over our first three dyads. So for inclusion and exclusion criteria, these are just some highlights. We use very, the same inclusion and exclusion criteria that um, Annie and Michael spoke about in their presentation. So one part, but we have two people. So one partner must have PTSD for at least six months. Other partner cannot. They can't have current substance uh, dependence or psychosis, and they have to agree to titrate off their psychotropic meds. So that's the same as the other studies. This is a snapshot of our outcome measures. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I've highlighted and I've bolded out for you the ones I want you to maybe attend to at the moment. So in terms of our primary outcome measures, we're using the CAPS-5, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, which we can think about as being the gold standard for uh, assessment of PTSD symptoms. And we're using the Couple Satisfaction Inventory, which is a measure of relationship satisfaction. And within our secondary outcomes, and these are some of the ones I'm going to be showing you a little tiny piece of today, um, are a self-report measure of PTSD symptoms, the, the PCL, which is the PTSD checklist. And it's reported on by both the person with PTSD and the partner. So the partner's repeat, reporting on their perceived symptoms of the person with PTSD. As well as we have a whole host of other measures, including both um, psychological health and outcome measures for both the person with PTSD as well as their partner. So this is our protocol flow. Um, so the yellow stars are our assessment time points. And you'll see um, as we go through it, we've got, we start with the baseline. We have two prep visits, and that's really getting people uh, prepped for the idea of what they're going to be going through and information about the MDMA sessions. And then we do in-person CBCT. In-person CBCT, we do a condensed day. We do what is going to equate to three sessions of uh, psychotherapy within that day. And I'm going to show you in a few slides what that actually looks like, what that content is. We do that first in person. Then the next morning, we get back together and we do a condensed version of two more sessions of the CBCT. And that's the prep, the setup to go into the MDMA session. Then they have the MDMA session, as you've heard described before. They're dosed together, and they're there for the whole day, and they stay overnight. And the next morning, we do an integration, which is more a check-in, seeing how you're doing, how the processing is going. And then we assign um, out-of-session assignments, so things that they're going to do and practice between that time and the next time we're together. Then over the next three weeks, they have four telehealth sessions with their therapists. So there's a therapist team. We're doing this differently. We don't do male-female dyads and of therapists here. We're doing our, our thinking on this as we're actually trying to use one person who has experience in one person who has experience in MDMA psychotherapy. So we, we switch off in terms of who is the therapist dyad. So you do four sessions of um, CBCT over telehealth, and then you come back together and do more in-person CBCT the day before the second MDMA session. You have the second MDMA session, integration, and follow it up with four more telehealth sessions. So I'll show you more detail right now. So phase one, 
is the rationale for treatment and education about PTSD and relationships. So these first two modules are done in that in-person day together. So we see introduction and safety building, and you immediately move into phase two, which is satisfaction, enhancement, and undermining avoidance. So also in that in-person on that first day together, you're also doing what's called listening and approaching. And so this is the beginning of communication skills building. And so they're able to start to learn some of those skills and put them in practice that night. And the next day, before they're given the MDMA, they learn some more communication skills about sharing thoughts and feelings. And this is a lot of this is paraphrasing, learning to identify those thoughts and feelings with each other. The idea is we're prepping them up for the MDMA session to have that in mind that they're primed, they have something that they can turn to and use together. Then they have the MDMA session. In that session itself, we are using that as a time for practice, a time to be able to come up, use whatever comes up in that session, and then we will, you know, if they, for example, want to communicate together, we'll be able to prompt them to say, hey, can you, for example, tell me what Jill was saying? Can you tell me what you were hearing Jill say? And be able to paraphrase back. So being able to implement the things that they've already been thinking about ahead of time, they're primed up. So you have the in-person check the day after the MDMA session. And then we have the next two over video conference, we talk about, first of all, getting unstuck. And this is the process of learning how to do the cognitive work together, of teaching how to do this idea of challenging thoughts that might be getting them stuck and staying in PTSD. And we also do a module on problem solving. So then we're into phase three. So phase three is making meaning of the trauma. So we do... Each session is then based on a different theme that is often related to PTSD. Some will be more or less relevant to the individual, but touching on them, opening up that conversation, saying, here are some ideas. These are things that we know often come up for folks. What do you think about that? How does that relate to your experience? Can help direct or guide the conversation as well as the integration of the MDMA session. So acceptance and blame were talked about over telehealth. Then when we come back together for that session, we have the, the ideas of trust and control that are done the day before. So then we move back into the second MDMA session. And that's, again, another opportunity to be primed up for the themes that they've already thought about. And so they have the opportunity to talk about whatever comes up in that session for either of them. And that's a really important point. The, the focus is not solely on the person with PTSD, it is on their relationship and how PTSD impacts both of them. So we see in the sessions that we have content, we have you know, process coming up for both people. And that's so very important, especially when, you, when you're in that space of having the empathy and connection between the two, to be able to really understand and hear. And that might be have been the first time in a very long time, the person with PTSD is not in a state where they're feeling avoidant. And they can actually be present with their partner when their partner's telling them something difficult too. So it's really, you know, goes both ways within that. In-person check, and then these are our last four modules with the last four themes we talk through. Emotional closeness, physical closeness, post-traumatic growth, and then summing up and ending therapy. So this is a picture of the therapy room. This might look a little familiar. It is in Michael and Annie's office in Charleston. However, we've changed it up, and now we have two chairs um, for the two members of the dyad, and they can swivel, they can face each other, they lie back in these, and you're, you're sitting in the therapist's view right now, looking out towards them. So really, we're learning what we can do on MDMA. We're learning what might be effective, what might not. We're trying to figure this out. For example, a massive piece of many cognitive behavioral therapies and a big piece of this cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy is the idea of Socratic questioning asking questions to keep going, to keep digging, to see if there's something underlying it, something that's driving the stuckness, driving the upset. So when can you do Socratic questioning? At the height of an MDMA experience? Great, go for it. You know, people respond super well. At the end of the session, maybe not so much. Maybe that's not gonna that's not going so well. So we're we're learning to tailor, for example, when you might want to use that approach or maybe not so much within the session. Also, we've come to the conclusion over the, the, you know, the first three dyads that we've been working with of really trying to maximize the ability to spend some time inside, make use of that opportunity for both members of the dyad. So being able to take that time when they have the space to be able to reflect and then to be able to come out and talk about that. 
We've been working about facilitating and checking in about communication between the partners. So, for example, when one person might be, you know, popping up, taking off their eye shades, ready to talk, and the other partner might be really deeply inside some pro internal process, maybe they're not ready to have that conversation yet. So our role as the therapist is to check, right, to check in and say, hey, Jill, are you ready to have this conversation with Joe at the moment? You can say yes or no in that moment. So the ability to kind of orchestrate and, and be able to be watchful about what's happening there. And also we've decided at this point to not present new material during the MDMA session, but rather use that time to optimize the practice, the learning, being able to have it sink in, feel all those wonderful things that will come up during the MDMA session and help to solidify and crystallize some of those ideas that we've been talking about before. So here is some data from our very first cases. So you're the first audience who's going to ever see these very first pieces of data. Um, so what I'll show you here, and I'll take you through what each of these things mean, but we have three cases that we've seen so far. And you'll see the top line, the PTSD positive, that means the person who has PTSD in the relationship. The second line is the partner, and so that's the, their partner going through it with them. And then PCL stands for their self-report data, so either of the individual or of the person of the partner. So our first dyad, you'll see, started out, this is a baseline. So this is before they've met with anyone. Baseline 54, that's quite high. And by the first CBCT visit, this is the power of assessment, folks, it's gone down to 44, right? So this is, they haven't had any action uh, at this point. And by the end of the therapy, they've gone down to 24. So that's a significant drop on the PCL. And at six month follow up, they're at a 23, so staying stable. So at that point, of, on that measure, that does not is not indicative anymore of PTSD. Their partner had a lower rating. So when we look at partner ratings, we're looking at to see do they match and do they follow the same trajectory. So you can see a bit of difference here. Same at the first CBCT. End of therapy, you see they are closely aligned. What we see that also is being representative of is communication. That means they're talking about what's going on, but it's the same conceptualization of what's happening. So following that, and we see that's also stable at six month follow up. So, and then in terms of relationship satisfaction, the relationship satisfaction we're using here is that, don't we use that instead? Okay. I'm going to use this instead. So relationship satisfaction, a three means happy, and anything below that is unhappy. Anything above that is in, in a much happier range. So the first CBCT visit, we saw scores of two and one, which indicates that they're not very happy. And by end of therapy, they're happy and very happy. And at six-month follow-up, they're very happy and extremely happy. So we're seeing some impact there. And then the second diet, I want to emphasize this. This is 66 on the PCL, is very high, and a zero from the partner. The partner has zero idea what is happening with the individual with PTSD. They think they're fine. So then they start to go, okay, we've had assessment. We're talking about this. I'm starting to understand maybe there's something happening. Score is coming up. End of therapy, they're almost perfectly aligned, and there's almost no PTSD there. They started happy and stayed happy. So what do we think is happening? So, so far, these are some initial musings. We're thinking that the learning experience of not avoiding in the session, of sharing, of going through, of working with those stuck points is helpful. And we're, I'm framing this from a cognitive behavioral standpoint. We're also thinking some of the possible purported mechanisms of action include some cognitive flexibility, include some reduced rigidity, we're also really seeing a decrease so far. This is colloquial. We don't have data on this yet, but in dissociation and numbing, two of the hardest things to get at when we're doing any type of PTSD treatment. Also, some ideas that were coming to mind, the idea of decentering from that experience and some self-compassion, and really that it's an evolving process and template that we keep seeing going over time. We also see wider gains so far that people are we're noticing. So not just reduction in PTSD symptoms and increased relationship satisfaction, but we're thinking about ideas and we've seen data from some of the other studies. For example, in this concept of openness to experience, interconnectivity, introspection, and common experience. And so really our next step is seven more dyads. So we're going to test it out. So we're almost, we're in the midst of it right now. And so we're really excited to see how those next seven are going to go. So thank you. I think we might have time.
I think there's time for a question. Question. Come on. Come on up. Come on down. What's your first name, please? Chris. Thank you. Uh, you'd mentioned that you went with CBT because it was something you were already familiar with and there was a, a large population of therapists that would be available to use that during studies. I'm wondering if EFT has ever been considered specifically for couples and whether or not what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, for sure. So EFT, so motion focused therapy, is um, another couple's treatment that's been used for PTSD as well. And so for sure that's an option in the future. Um, there's less data on EFT at this point in time, um, but that doesn't, doesn't mean to say that wouldn't be effective too. Yeah, thanks. It's Jay. Hey, Ann. Hey. Um, I was just curious, in this model, what are the guidelines, if any, for possibility of a couple becoming either too intimate or too hostile, but I, I think because MDMA is involved, like it's the intimacy part that I'm really curious about. Is yeah. there some point where you have to kind of limit it because it's anti-therapeutic or? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it's funny, the set and setting are so very important, like we've heard talked about before in terms of the context context of doing MDMA therapy. And it's so very clearly a therapy session when the couple is together. So the idea of moving through the really difficult conversations that come up, um, as we've heard talked about, this like spontaneous reporting of traumatic events, it, it, there is um, certainly a strong connection that is developed. But, you know, I think um, the most that we've, you know, seen is kind of a, a loving, uh, like a handhold or a, the desire to hug. And so the idea of um, it go, getting, getting at a hand in terms of in that setting, um, I think is a pretty low risk considering what the set setting and content is that is being discussed. And in terms of conflict, you're, you're right, it, it's uh, far less volatile in the room uh, than it is without MDMA. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we have time for one more. Your first name, please. Hi, my name is Grace. Um, so this kind of work is super interesting to me. It's my first experience to it. Uh, but I was going to ask, what is the benefit to having a different kind of therapy dyad or therapist dyad rather than just male-female? And also, um, for other disorders that affect relationships, like severe or, resi or treatment-resistant depression and that how that affects, do you think MDMA could like help with that as well, or would it be like different outcomes? Um, so I'll answer the second question, part of the question first. I think it's a, totally, it's an empirical question. I think it's t very much worth exploring. I think it potentially could have anything that would increase understanding communication between partners around a disorder, particularly when it impacts a relationship like we know depression does. Um, I think there could be a, a lot of benefit there. Um, we need to investigate it. And then in terms of not using male, th female therapy uh, therapist team, you know, I have lots of different thoughts about it. In this case, it was very much pragmatic um, because it just so happened that the two of us who are investigators um, who have CBCT uh, background are both female. So there was no option on our end in terms of one of us being male. So, but I think it actually is opening up the conversation a bit more broadly around what then would it look like in terms of different constellations of therapist teams. And thus far, it's interesting because I think no matter who it is who is going to be within the team can elicit different things from the client by virtue of not only your gender, but your age, but your, you know, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic, or perceived socioeconomic status, your perceived sexuality, any of these things. So I think there are a lot of other um, elements other than simply gender that um, probably fall into that and that we can, I think is actually going to be a really interesting thing as we go forward. And, and for example, this will be a study where we won't be holding to um, that gender dyad model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ann Wagner. Thank you. Thank you.